In the year 1997, the future is in chaos and turmoil. Mankind is on the brink of extinction. Brave survivors band together and build a time displacement apparatus to receive a signal from a parallel future. This transmission is the Boondicott. Official podcast of Bundablog.com, the home of whatever. I am your host, Stephen, and with me today is the glorious barefoot car vixen herself, the cohortress. Who are you? Who am I? You're introducing me. So say your name, Stephen. Okay. Day. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to say my name. You're supposed to call me. Introduce me. You gotta say Danny, and then I'm like, hey, what's up? Danny's here. Hey, what's up? There you go. Sorry, I'll fix that in editing, obviously. <laughs> um, we are on the road in a mobile podcast format. On the road again. Driving back from Walt Disney World. We're having a hot Mickey summer. Whoa. And that we got annual passes again. Danny prepared right. us for Galaxy's Edge's opening. Yes, I did. In beautiful Orlando, Florida. And uh, we just activated our annual passes. And I was like, you know, we have been waiting to see Pandora. Yep. Let's go look at what all the hubbub, hub, 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 hullabaloo? Hullabaloo, that's what I'm looking for. What all the hullabaloo is about. And it was about some floating rocks, and it was pretty dope. How's it took? It's very cool. We didn't actually ride anything because the ride times were so long. Are still extremely long. And right it's now. so hot that the only thing worthy of doing is seeking out ice cream bars and frozen drinks. I just think also as an annual pass holder, like you're a sucker if you wait in the line. Like you gotta plan your plan your time, get your fast passes so you can three months in advance and then you go. Yeah, annual I think an annual pass holder really lets you just like Take things at your own Enjoy pace. Enjoy the park very leisurely. That's yeah. how we approach it, at least. Yeah. You don't have to buy, like, everything. You don't have to, like, wait in the lines. You can just sort of... And everybody... Every pass holder is different. Some people, like, always do that stuff, but... Some people try to... Some people just have to be, like, do as much as possible while All they're the there. Time, yeah. yeah no. We did that for a while. Like, when we first started going, we were like, man, we gotta wake up at 6, get to the parks, walk around, and now we're just like... Yeah, Once you do everything two times, it's like... Uh, yeah, it's just more of a fun thing to do. It. But at this point, it's been so long and since we had a pass, and now there is a bunch of new, newer stuff to do, and there's going to be Galaxy's Edge opening up, so... Yeah, we still haven't done Frozen Ever After, nope. so we got to check that out. We still haven't done any of the rides in the new lands. Like, we didn't do the Toy Story rides. We haven't done Pandora rides, none of those. We just ogled the architecture... Saw a very nice drumming show for the official Pandora drummers. Oh man. Where They're Disney employees show. just look like half hearted hippies. They looked they all looked like van hashtag van life. Yeah. People like they live in a van in the Disney parking lot and then they come to do the show twice a day. Then they go back to their van. Oh, that van is so hot. That van but no, they you, got by the time you get back in that van, it probably takes like two hours for the van to cool not be 90 degrees. Yeah. So you're saying that they just live in the park until they can get to their van? I'm saying you want that van in a covered area. You yeah. cannot put it in a Disney parking lot. You gotta go to park in Disney Springs permanently. That's it. We're gonna do Disney van life hack video. Disney. <laughs> uh, but today... I have actually heard that there are no. some Disney employees that really do live in vans. Really? Because they can't afford to live in Orlando. That's a joke? 
No. Oh, man. I, and every joke is based on truth. Whoa. Yeah, there you it's go. dark stuff. It's dark. It's dark stuff, dark truth, or hilarious. <laughs> However you want to look at it. Um, so, last time that you heard me and Danielle's silky sweet voices was when we were doing our panels at Florida Supercon, our Florida podcast hub panel, and our uh, Trailers from the Crypt panel, um, which both went, both went pretty well. Um, I'd like to send out a special thanks to Fanatically Correct for that uh, small little bit of audio they sent us uh, with their own podcasting tips, and it was it's good to connect with local South Florida podcasters. So if you have a South Florida podcast and you guys want to trade some ads with the Vundacast, please feel free to reach out uh, at Vundablog or at Vundacast or email us Vundablog at gmail.com If we can't get that BMB sponsorship we can certainly advertise all the little guys. Well, I would love to it would be amazing if we had like a local thing. Sponsorship? That we could advertise. Like, I, I would love it if we, like, had, like, uh, like, Super Wheels. Go to Super Wheels on Sunday and say, put the cast, they'll let you in for a dollar. No, no, no. SMN International. That's all we need. We need... The, a car dealership. We need a, a car dealership with, like, a very, very salsa-based... That's classic. ...ad slogan. That is a very classic Miami advertising, though. Like, the car dealership, you know? The Miami... Toyota's hot, hot, hot. Yeah, they love it. So, Florida Supercon was hot, hot, hot. And lots of great cosplays. Uh, got to meet Jonathan Frakes and talk to him. That was pretty dope. We got to uh, chat with uh, Jason David Frank, the Green Ranger. Courtesy, very nice. Courtesy of Andres and his uh, directing prowess. Getting us behind the table. Well, um, Blockbuster Guy Frank... Uh, has did a fantastic Florida Supercon cosplay montage epic 12 minute video saga uh, I asked him to cut it down into multiple videos and he was like no this is my artistic vision <laughs> <laughs> I think it's perfect now he loves his artistic vision uh, and also Frank did a fantastic job with his uh, Blair Witch parody advertisement video yes which I think set YouTube a place, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Or it should. It's at least such ten, good. It's at so good. least 10 views. It actually inspires me. I think Frank yeah. would be a great leading man. Yeah, totally. He could totally carry a movie. Yeah. I believe it. Yeah. Um, so today we're going to talk about some movies that were carried. Some summer movies that we saw? Yeah, movies yeah. for the summer. Uh, so, let's start off in the Comic-Con mood with Spider-Man Far From Home, the epilogue to what is now being known as the Infinity Saga, a.k.a. the 23 films. Is Far From Home part of the Infinity Saga, or no? It is the beginning of the next... It's the start of the next phase. It's the, I, I consider it the epilogue. It's yeah. like the last little cap in that wave of films. Yeah. And everything that comes now is so new and so fresh on the gap. So fresh and so clean, clean. I guess we could also talk about... Comic-Con? Yeah, a little bit. I guess in conjunction now that we have the context from Spider-Man Far From Home. Uh, yeah, if you want to. So, Spider-Man Far... I'm down. So, Spider-Man Far From Home, as uh, if you heard our two-part um, Avengers Endgame podcast, you'll know that me and Danny were not very satisfied with Avengers Endgame and its storytelling decisions. Uh, is that fair, assessment? Yeah. I think it's fair. I mean, I think I just, in general, I feel like the MCU, I, I, you know, you know, I've talked about this before, but I'm, I think that if this is the way movies are going to be now, if this is, if this is it, this is the part. and it very much seems that this is it, that we're just going to get big summer blockbusters and then everything else is literally going to be in the theater for a week and then move to streaming, that if these, these movies that are these tentpole movies, I'd like to see them attempt to elevate themselves into something more than just forgettable popcorn fan. 
because I think inevitably, maybe I'm wrong, because obviously this has been going on for 10 years and everyone's been still very excited and they're still making tons of money, but I don't know, for me, I'm, I'm getting very bored now, because I feel like the structure has not changed at all. And we should be the ones most excited, because exactly. we were so hyped when there was like just molecules of a, of a universe to yeah. play with. This, and this, that's the thing that's kind of frustrating for me, because this isn't something where like I'm a film Twitter person who never liked franchises and things like that. That's not at all where I'm coming from. I just come from a point where I'd like movies, I'd like these big movies to feel like they're, they don't have to be art. I'm not asking them to be art like, you know, like Roma. I'm not asking for that. I'm asking for an attempt to elevate the stories and have some sort of continuity. I really think that there is a lack of real continuity in, in these films and that's like all the, and, and the thing is, is that that's all they really have is continuity and even if it's continuity of like thematic material is you know what I mean I, I, like I've said this before it, even if it's not it's not necessarily they just I don't know I feel like a broken record at this point but for me Spider-Man Far From Home started out the way that every movie has now been everybody tells me it's the best Marvel movie since the last Marvel movie and it's unmissable and unmissable and then I go in and I watch it and I the movie ends the credits roll and I'm like eh okay that happened it just kind of passes over you and then it leaves you just as quickly and then it's gone as if you just drank it's just a lot of annoying beer. to me a lot of, it's, it passes through like beer that <laughs> I just I, I was unsatisfied with Spider-Man Far From Home because I was interested in watching a Spider-Man movie and it felt like a Tony Stark movie. It felt like these are the this is the fallout of Tony Stark's life. And Spider-Man just happens to be in it. It's I don't know, it's also just I have deep reservations about and I'm actually writing like a piece that I haven't finished on it because I I felt compelled to actually write a piece and not just like talk about it. But I have a deep um, sort of concern with this idea that now that Tony Stark has sort of martyred himself for humanity, that everything that he felt and believed is is completely right and we should continue on that sacrosanct, sort of, yeah. is that sort of mentality. I actually think that a lot of things that Tony did were very wrong. <laughs> And we should not continue. And, and the thing is, I don't know if with Far From Home and especially the, the teaser, the stinger at the end, or the mid credit scene, um, that ended on like a huge cliffhanger. I don't know if the intention of that is to perhaps actually make a statement that says, no, Tony isn't right and, and Spider-Man will make different choices for him. But part of me feels, and I rightfully so, because, you know, this isn't like Star Wars, where there's only been nine of these movies. There have been 20, nine plus what, like three, right? Eleven. Uh, what, if you count these movies? No, no, if you count Star Wars and like the extra movies, so it's been like... Ten. Ten, that's it, right, yeah. There have been ten Star Wars movies. There have been 23, 24 Marvel movies now. And... I don't feel confident in their ability to to try to do something, to, to tell me that certain things that they've set up in their storylines are going to pay off in an interesting way. And I am i don't think that Tony Stark should become this new passion of Their model. I don't. I, I think that Tony did a really heroic thing, and he sacrificed himself, and that was good. And I think that Tony was a very beleaguered hero because there was a lot of on his there was a lot on his mind and a lot of mistakes that he made. But I think that's that's the point is that he's a flawed person, not that he should be like yes, listen to Tony. Everything Tony did was gold. Like everything Tony did was not gold. Eh, I think the film, uh, on a whole, looks great. It looks wonderful, you know, yeah. Visual effects, fantastic. Everyone's performances, you know, work and are fun and everything. But just it, the whole build of that film is that we brought back the same J. Jonah Jameson. 
and Spider-Man who didn't want to be, who was about to out himself in the first movie, yeah. all the Tony Stark, should have outed himself then because yeah. now J. Jonah Jameson is outing him. He's outing him, yeah. Like, what does that morality tale mean? And the fact that these movies haven't ever espoused a, any Uncle Ben, you know, wisdom or ideology onto Spider-Man... I think it's kind They've of... They've substituted Uncle Ben and with Tony. Tony Stark, yeah. But I, 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 I feel like ben. that's... I don't know, there's just something that just feels really wrong about that to me. Yeah. And it just, it's... I feel like it's like bastardizing Spider-Man just to give more love and praise there's to... Just, yeah, to Tony Stark. To there's, Tony... There's to just, Robert Downey Jr., really. There's certain things that I feel like about... Spider-Man, Peter Parker, and Tony's relationship that I, I think, yeah, like for instance, you know Tony gives him these opportunities and all these things, but Tony is an extremely wealthy man. Meanwhile, Peter's always sort of been a hero of the people. Right. He's never, like right. talked about, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. He but, always feels, because he's so young, he always just feels so in awe of Tony's ability, powers, I and just, they, financial, they, like, situation. They make it there's seem... There's just certain things in their relationship that I feel like so I feel like Peter dynamic. doesn't challenge Tony in any way. I feel like Peter's only challenge to Tony has always been, oh crap, I'm I don't coming. want this little kid to die. Yeah, I'm coming, that's I it. don't want to come, that's it. You know what I mean? But like, the only it. two times they've actually fought together on screen is in Civil War yeah. and in the beginning of Infinity War. Yeah. And then now, at like the last moments of Endgame. Like, the first Spider-Man movie, you should have made it the Tony Stark and him team-up movie. If you wanted this reaction yeah. out of me, okay? Out of me. I mean, but if, obviously if, for if other people... If you wanted his identity to feel like I it was so important, that would have got that across to I'm me. just starting to feel also like we live in a world where people are... And, and this is not necessarily wrong, because I, I, am in, I am in fandom. I actively participate in fandom. I write fanfic. I've written fix it fic. I know that a lot of people write a lot of things that put fill in spaces in their narrative storytelling but I don't think that as audience members and as fans we should have to rely on any of that in yeah. order to have these stories be told in a, in a cohesive manner and, and, I, and I know that this is probably not true but part of me wonders if like they rely on this very short attention span that audience members have or the ability for audience members to just sort of like tweet about like well, you know, because because now I've noticed that it's not just about fanfic; it's about these like little sappy tweets that tend to go really viral. Where it's like, oh my god, I just realized that when this 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 and this happened, it's because of this this and this, and they get fifteen thousand likes, and everybody cries, and that's a very visual, immediate people having their own insight impact. You can see that the the Marvel and Disney can see, right? But that insight is some, a lot of those insight things are not born of anything in the actual story, and so I'm like sitting here thinking, is the concept that they don't really have any need to tell a complete story per movie, and that like, or the complete story is so simplistic, right? And then anything that they sort of carry over to the next movie, they can literally rewrite or record whatever they want. Like they barely hang on to like any sort of like. Like, I can tell you a million things that happened in Iron Man 1 that have, like, no bearing in, in by the time you get to Avengers yeah. Infinity War. And, and I feel like even things like Civil War, which I think should have a way bigger impact. And I know that they're sort of doing this thing where they're like, well, once Thanos came, nobody cared anymore. But I don't think that that's necessarily true. Yeah. Like, I don't think that it's just that nobody would care anymore. It's lazy. It's very... I think it's lazy. If you don't have superpowers, you don't have free will, you don't have, like, motivation, like, yeah. So, go see Spider-Man Far From Home. <laughs> Tom Holland... Far Asper, From Your Home. Tom Holland, as per usual, is always wonderful. Zend Zendaya's wonderful. Zendaya... They're all wonderful. I'm not saying they're not wonderful. I just, yeah. The only thing I will say is that I think Samuel L. Jackson and, um... Colby Smolders. Colby Smolders looked confused. In that yeah, movie. they got they got really screwed over because they apparently had no idea. Yeah. According to interviews, that... Colby Smolders said that her and Sam Jackson had no idea while they were filming that their characters were actually scrolls the whole movie. Yeah, 
and that Sam only found out when he did the after credit scene. Which sort of upsets me because when I was watching this movie, I was like, why is Samuel L. Jackson... Why, phoning it in. Why is he phoning it in so hard? He looks confused. And then I thought, oh, okay, he's a <laughs> scroll. That makes sense. But now I feel maybe the directions they were giving him were to be more befuddled. I don't know. But it was very odd. And I and I, and I, so I thought, oh, okay, so they knew they were aliens the whole time. Then it makes sense why he was behaving a certain way. But now he didn't know he was an alien the whole, the whole time. So now I can't no longer use that excuse to reconcile his odd performance. I don't think they know what to do with Sam Jackson either. Yeah. Because... So- the, the fact that I heard uh, the Russo brothers and Marcus and McFeely, the writers of Endgame, being like, we didn't want to put Nick Fury in the final battle because having a guy shooting a gun isn't going to work in the final battle. That's I, just boring. Like, why can't he... He's freaking Nick Fury. I think there should be You can point. give him and put him in whatever you want during the final battle. But Sam Jackson was, in the, was the connection to get you to this movie... How are you not going to put him in the biggest, most crazy shot of I all this? I think they should kill him off. Especially when Sam Jackson got screwed out of being in a hero shot in in the first Avengers movie. Yeah. Okay? He's ostensibly, like, the first black Avenger, yeah. but he never gets to do shit, except yeah. for be like, yo, come over here. Um, that, that rubs me the wrong way. I think they should kill him off. Because I think that they don't know what to do with his character. And I feel like he's just become sort of the avatar of, oh, guys, guess what? Here's some... He's become the um, deus ex machina. He's, he's the harbinger. He's become the, the Chekhov's gun. Like, he just comes in and delivers some, like, random plot device. Wait till he device. gets back here with the helicarrier. Exactly. He's like, well, I've got this secret thing you never knew about. Here you go. Bye. He's total just random exposition that appears out of nowhere in the story. And I don't think... And I really... It's just, I think also, too, Marvel, they're not, I don't know how they're handling or if the struggle is, is there a way to handle, essentially what they're doing is making a multi-million dollar, billion dollar TV show. It is. You know what I mean? And so, how they struggle with, I guess, that that whole idea. Maybe because they push against it. And they don't think about it in that terms, but maybe if they did think about it in that terms, they would be better off. What's going to happen now that their multi-million dollar theatrical TV show is going to actually become real yeah. TV shows yeah. on Disney Plus? Exactly. Like, is that going to water gonna see? down the brand? Or what are we going to see? How is it going to Finally gonna strengthen it? Because I, I just think it's ridiculous that, like, you've been doing this for 10 years. And you introduce less characters than the CW has in the exact same amount of time. And you've killed off more characters. Yeah. You know? Um, I, I mean, and, and the new phase, I'm, I will say I'm excited about um, so all the new characters. At San Diego I, Comic-Con, they announced yeah. Shang-Chi, uh, which, you know, it's hard to say anything about these things because all they have is really, like, a director and a few names attached to them. Yeah. For the most part, like there's not anything concrete beyond logos. There were we there fonts. were certainly a lot of logos. Yeah, we got a lot of fonts. Um, there were a lot of logos in that presentation. So a Loki TV show. I feel so oversaturated in a way with this stuff. I love how people love to say there's too much Star Wars, and I'm like, bitch, where? When I look at the amount of Marvel shit that they're just piling yeah. up. Like, they just keep sh- Every three oh months? Oh my god. Yeah. Every three months it's a new Marvel thing. It's a new Marvel thing. And it's now it's a Marvel TV show. Now it's like two or three Marvel TV shows. Now it's like movies. And they didn't even get to announce every movie. Like they well, were they like... got a year and a half in? Yeah. And so I think we're most excited for, at least me and you probably. Yeah. Thor Love and Thunder? Yes, definitely Thor Love and Thunder. It's a great font. I'm excited for my bike. The Return of Natalie Portman? Yes. Which I think is exciting on a Star Wars front in that she's back in the good graces of Disney. I know, yeah. Did she accept a check big enough to take her to to, over to episode 9? Well, I wonder if that was a proviso of her allowing, allowing herself to be an endgame. 
you know? Like, okay, I'll let you put me in Endgame, but I want to star in my own Thor movie now. Screw you. <laughs> I don't know about all that. They, so they backed up the money truck and they said, here you go. No, but it's if you let us have you in Endgame and go to the premiere and do yeah. all the things for it, you'll get a nice 20 million freaking Jillian dollar check. And I you'll hope get to that be she's been able to sort of reconcile her with her feelings with the MCU because she was one of those people that critiqued. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think I, I'm totally, like... Obviously, yes, it's not the first time she's been in a multi-million dollar, billion dollar making franchise. She was in Star Wars, but she was also an extremely young woman when she was in Star Wars. It was a different world. Yeah. And uh, most of the film choices that Natalie Portman has made have been very small, smaller, smaller films, more art house films, more independent films. I think These are the kinds of movies she likes to do. And she left them to do, like, Black Swan and work with Darren yeah. and work with, like, Which you are know, kind of like very high-profile filmmakers Like, I guess you would say, like, main, like, main big-budget indie is what you call them. Okay. Right? Sure, I guess. I know there's, there's probably another term I just don't remember, but I call them big-budget indie, and you know, people call them big-budget indie. But yeah, like, essentially it's like big-budget art house indie films, you know, that you work with these very esoteric charges who sort of have made a name for themselves. Um based on their, like, auteur, their auteur work, you know? That's the kind of stuff she likes to do. That's the stuff she's always liked to do. Well, I think it's interesting she's going on to that movie and Taika Waititi's directing it. So yeah. she knows the creative that she's she's getting with, you know? Yeah, but she won't. Like, that was probably the, I imagine, the hesitation with why she fell in, not in love with the Thor franchise. Yeah. She went with working with Kenneth Branagh yeah. to working with a first-time film director who had come off Game of Thrones. And then that movie was... And that movie made very odd choices with her character that I'm sure she didn't like. And that movie was seen to be the the worst of the Marvel Studios films yeah. when it came out. She's probably like, well, I'm done with this. I also feel, now thinking about it, that Endgame tried to uh, sort of like retcon its own history during the movie yeah. by and like its own like Marvel history during the movie by like being like yeah we do have positive mother characters look Thor is finally talking to his mother finally uh, it's yeah. not all about fathers I think um and I, then I, like oh look at the last minute oh look all the female Avengers are together how great how fun. oh no I really don't I don't like the I do not like this sort of well, we got all these women to stand in the line, so obviously we're feminists. Yeah. I'm sorry, and I think that it's very cheap, and I know it's very effective. People get very like emotional. <gasps> Look at all the ladies, like, and it's almost kind of like they're reminding it's cool. us. They're reminding us how many ladies they have, and I'm like, that's great. I know that you have lots of ladies, but it's not about how lot many ladies you have. It's about what you're doing with them, you know. And again, you know, then you have Black Widow storyline where she. What did she become and who she became and how she became? And we can talk but about now that, but I don't we're going to get that. the Black Widow film finally. Yeah, finally, after 10 years. After 24 <laughs> movies. We're finally going to roll the dice on when Scarlett. No one, when no one likes Scarlett Johansson anymore. No, but what, like, what, how, how late is Disney to the ball of, like, Scarlett Johansson's a bankable actress. All right. 10 years later, I guess. I, you, she can, is? you can obviously sure. tell, like, oh, we've talked about this, the behind, some of the behind the scenes activities that went on obviously affected the kinds of movies they were making. And I'm very happy that they're making more diverse films now with different characters. Um, and I want that. But it's just, it's more to be about the quality of the movies. And I was not one of the people that was very overwhelmed with the um, Captain Marvel movie. I thought it was right by the numbers. I thought that there was some nice stuff in it. There was some nice feminine journey, female gaze, feminine um, hero journey, you know what I mean, in that movie, heroine journey, in that film. But for the most part, it was very by the book. And I think that it took a couple, like, cheap, you know, quick, easy ways to just be like, look at her, she's a lady hero. And then they did nothing with her in Avengers. And I think that's one of the reasons why I felt like I was pushed back against the Captain Marvel movie because it didn't feel like they knew what they were doing with her. And then it turns out they had no idea what they were doing. They didn't know that. And because and Endgame then, was coming out, they didn't know what to do with her either. They didn't know what to do with her. And, and so they did nothing both, with her. And so both, in, both yeah. parties decided to not screw up either person's movie. Exactly. We'll both make the most bland 
version. I really it's possible. I really think that, that movie is going to be something that people are going to look back on in another five years and be like, "Wow, why did I ever think this was really good?" The you one know? thing I will say is that it it has like several moments in Captain Marvel mm-hmm. that work really well, that are really fun. That you're like, "Yeah, action! Oh, absolutely. Yeah, music! Yeah, punches!" Like all that stuff cinematically like it's fun it's great that's why it's so frustrating that all the other bits of it just can't seem to form a coherent body (laughs) and uh one of the other tidbits came out of San Diego Comic Con was that uh the endgame writer said that they had no idea that the space stone was in Captain Marvel because if not they would have gone to the 90s and maybe incorporated into the plot or something like that yeah which I think would have been really fun and easy to do, considering that you guys were shooting both films, like, the around same the same time. Yeah. So you could have probably actually, like, put an endgame, like, like teaser in the actual Captain Marvel movie. Like, there's so many possibilities, and it's just, I don't know, frustrating. At this point, you just play the what-if game with, with Marvel Cinematic Universe. And they're going to do it themselves with their own animated show. What if? Yeah, what if, exactly. What if our movies were... More coaching. So that was our episode for this week. Um, talk some good bits of Marvel, uh, speculation and stuff. Oh, one last thing before we go. WandaVision was announced. So I believe that's the one show Danny's probably. Oh yeah. Actually interested and excited about. Super excited. Which I hope that show is freaking awesome. So that I feel more proud. When we display our Age of Ultron, Wanda, and Vision poster that we have. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. We're ready. We're ready now. Uh, I might also just put this on the record. My theory is that WandaVision, based on the font and based on what I know about comics, I think WandaVision is going to be Wanda bringing Vision back into reality vis-a-vis her powers and then reality changing into like a 1950s-esque aesthetic or something like that. That'd be cool. And then the Doctor Strange movie, Multiverse of Madness, will hopefully be like Undo the that? be like. But the, that concerns me. Un- that unraveling try to of do whatever. The house of the M with her and end up That's her. what I think they're gonna do. And they're gonna, so do they're gonna kill her. Well, I don't think they have to kill her. I think it's not. You know, they she they they already killed off their last earliest. Like yeah. she's she's the second female Avenger. But I have to say You're gonna kill off the first female Avenger and then the second female Avenger back to, to back? I have to say oh. the House of M storyline is extremely problematic. So if they're in a house of M her, they better get ready for something pieces. <laughs> because yeah. it's a problem. It is, but it's also I think it's a fun story. I think it's a good it's a fun concept. It's a fun concept. To rewrite reality. Of course, but it always and tends see to different be versions about everybody. curtailing female power. You know what I mean? Like, the more powerful the female characters become, the more they're like, no, they must be stopped. It's Dark Phoenix all over again. It's that sort of idea. But, like, she's too powerful to exist, so we have to stab her. And that's what the Wundercast is about every week. <laughs> For her choice, we have to keep you in line. Don't, don't go super Phoenix Force Mega Saiyan. Uh, I'm your host, Steven. I've been Danny. And remember, kids... When you're driving back from Orlando and you're getting sleepy, pull over and be yourself. Hey, Wonder. Hey, Wonder. Wondercast? Give yeah. it up for Wondercast, man. What an adorable name. You're listening to the Wondercast. What's up, everybody? This is Jason David Frank, the Green Ranger. You're listening to Boondocast. We got it! Subscribe to the Wundercast. This is Danielle. 
This is Steven. And we're here to tell you about the Voondacast, official podcast of Voondablog.com, the home of whatever. We talk comics, movies, pop culture, dogs, Miami drivers, spies, everything and anything awesome that we love, we talk about on this podcast every Monday at 4 Eastern Time, only here on the Radioactive Underground. Radiate. Radiate.